Welcome to the Journals, I'm Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say we're joined by Alison McConnell and Barry Anderson of The Evening News. Great to bring somebody back from my old haunting ground, Ali. It's as simple as that. I always get a kind of a, an emotional uh, feeling when I get somebody who, who's done that beat. Hearts, hearts, Hibs, Wraith Rovers, Dunfermline, it's all there. It doesn't get any better. A beautiful city, a big castle. What more do you need, Barry? Terrific. Great place to do your work, Peter. I can't argue. Yeah, absolutely. We've got lots to talk about. Uh, as ever, I've got a top ten for you, Ali. Um, Inverness, Cali Thistle's on the agenda. Hearts, Hibs, it should be. It's the derby coming up. We'll talk about managers under real pressure. Um, and over and above that, we've got a top ten because I, I looked at, you know what it's like. I don't know if you wake up in the middle of the night and you start scrolling and you, you see a poll. And that's exactly what happened last night, Ali. There was a top ten athletes of all time, according to US sports fans. <clears throat> and I automatically thought to myself, wow, what a limited market that must be. So i put them together and I've got 10 for us and see yeah. if you can add to it. Okay. Okay, simple as that. The look of disdain <laughs> on your face tells me I'm on the right track. Um, Inverness Cali Thistle is something that, it's a story that has unfolded with more than a few clubs in Scotland who run the club as a business, Barry, and then make decisions that suddenly take you down a road to rack and ruin. Yeah, I've seen it so many times, Peter, you know, Motherwell Hearts, Rangers, obviously, and... It's, hell, it's horrible to watch. You've seen it yourself. You see these people, people that work at these clubs, they, they put their heart and soul into their job. They don't earn ma massive salaries and some of them can end up out of a job when something like, that, like this happens. And apart from the football consequences, there are personal consequences to it as well. And it, it's just terrible to watch, a brutal process. And, and thoughts go out to everybody up at Inverness for, for, you know, for what might happen there over the next coming weeks. You need to just pray that that as many staff can stay on as possible. Yeah, and the other thing about it here, with administration, there's no black and white with it, Ali. There's just layer upon layer of, that was a mistake, this board's a mistake, this decision here was a mistake. Uh, there are various things that suddenly you get to a situation where you're on a roller coaster and then eventually you can't get off it and you, you, you're you're obviously trying to firefight, and that's what's been happening in Inverness. Subsequently, they've been deducted 15 points. Uh, they're in uh, you know, a negative situation in the league, precarious as it is with maybe 25 games to try and save their position, but more importantly, looking for a benefactor to bail them out eventually. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's been an inevitability about what was coming over the last couple of weeks when... When you started to hear what the situation was and the extent of the situation, you know, and you've got um, Duncan Ferguson paying petrol and paying expenses fees for his players off his own back, I think you knew what was coming down the track. I think now courting someone to come in and try and stabilise the club, club, bring finances to try and uh, keep them afloat, I think it's very difficult. I think it's... a uh, it's not an easy thing to do, especially now when you're at a situation where you've been docked 15 points. Again, you think, can you actually recover from that without slipping further down? And then if that happens, it becomes very difficult to try and rescue the situation at all, I think. Yeah, I mean, the former chairman, Alan Savage, has already put £350,000 uh, into the club. He has um, vowed to pay the cost of an administration as well with... Figures quoted at around half a million. And, and that's before you start to look at how do we stabilise everything. The one thing that sticks in my mind about this whole process and where you started to see the decline is the board at times, and, and many before, look at other ways they can bring in revenue. And they think, well, if we can supplement it with something over and above the club, then it might be a good idea until such times as it comes unstuck. They get into a deal with a concert company and that just didn't work and, and it put them in. This is really what accelerated the process. Absolutely, they all, you're right, the directors will come up with a safeguarding plan that will, that will try and keep them going. And when it doesn't work out, it can get to de a desperate stage and that's when administrators obviously end up moving in. And all they can do is prune, you know, cut costs, cut staff, cut players, coaches, whatever, you know, wherever they, they, they'll target areas that they think they can cut back. Um, the one thing about Inverness, they do have a good youth set up up there. Uh, as you've seen with, with players coming through, guys like Harper and, and Mackay in recent years, um, so they'll need to rely on that even more, particularly you know, in, in the third tier if they're going to get out of this. But 
they're already on minus three points. It's a very tough ask. Morale will be through the floor, understandably. Um, so it's, it's, it's a horrible situation for everybody involved. I, I must admit, it's got to be the toughest area uh, to try and run a football club in the current setup in the league system, whether it's you know whether you're in, uh, in the lower leagues or whether you're in the top flight. Because Malky Mackay said to me up at uh, Ross County, he had to build a new team every season mm -hmm. because you're you're convincing people to come to an area they they're not keen to go and live in, and then you're obviously trying to get a certain calibre of player. Um, and then you can't overcommit to them for a two and three year deal. You've got to somehow say, come up for the year if you enjoy it and you produce, you might get a bigger move or you might want to stay longer. And, and Malky would have had an advantage at Ross County because they're in the Premiership. So you're at least enticing people with top flight football with a chance to play against bigger clubs. Inverness are in League One now and they're bottom of League One. And they'll be trying to, I would, you would assume in time, they will try to entice people up there you know, to play in the third tier. That's a much more difficult task, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how it's all going to end up, but uh, as ever with administration, uh, you've got board members uh, you know, fighting in the background who were on the board uh, and countless others who have a story to blame someone for the demise of the club. It took so long to create that club, uh, Ali, in the first place, uh, in that region where, you know, Inverness, Cali, coming together from two clubs was problematic in itself and and I, I would hate to see them go. Yeah, I think um I think it would be a loss to see them go. I think uh, I think for the area itself it would be disappointing to lose one of the clubs, particularly particularly when you consider the background and the back story and the formation of the club and how it came about. I think um, you know, you look back to, to maybe the higher points of where they were not too long ago and, and the success that they've had in the time that they've been formed. I think losing any club, it's, it's a loss to the league, it's a loss to the landscape of the, the Scottish football culture. And of course they've etched themselves in history as well. We'll see how that all unfolds. Give us your thoughts on Inverness if you are indeed one of those fans who's watched uh, the horror story unfold. Uh, from there to a game that we should look forward to because it's one of my favourites on the calendar. I think if you I think if you live in a city and get immersed in everything about Edinburgh and the rivalry between the Green and Maroon, uh, Hibs and Hearts, uh, you see a very different rivalry from Celtic and Rangers. Um, and, you know, I, for one, thoroughly enjoyed my beat there because you had some fantastic games. But we're about to go to Easter Road, Barry, for 12th against 11th, Hibs against Hearts. Crazy if you just said that back in June, Peter, that these two would be bottom of the table come the derby at the end of October. People would have laughed at you, but that's the situation that we're in. And make no bones about it, we're here because results haven't been good enough, performances haven't been good enough. And you know, one manager, one manager has already paid the price for that and lost his job. But going back to the games themselves, I mean, they're, they're brilliant games to cover, they're brilliant just to be in the stadium, whether it's at Easter Road or Tyne Castle. Um, it's one of those games that you look forward to in the fixture list and you, you say, you know, looking forward to going to my work that day um, and you don't get that too often. Yeah, I always felt safe, Ali. I know you're, you're going to smile, but I always felt as it was a, a real safe period in my life. 12 years of, the only question was, are you a jambo or a hippie? That's, <laughs> that's all that mattered to them. There was no, I mean, I'm sure there are people who are going to jump on this bandwagon and say there's some kind of religious angle on it, but Hearts and Hibs fans, certainly, it was, are you a jambo or a hippie? There wasn't that same poisoned element about it, but there was What's a, the answer? What are you? Hey? What are you? Well, I, 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 the thing is, my best pal at the time was John Robertson, <laughs> and, and my other best pal, as you know, is Darren Jackson, so I had the best of both worlds. But they were all, they were good teams. You had, you know, when I was on that beat, you, you had Rob, you had Gary Mackay, um, you know, you had, a, you had a great heart side with Craig Levine at the back. Uh, my God, when I started, Sandy Jarden was player of the year for the Hearts at 37. Um, but not player of the year just at Hearts, player of the year for the whole of Scotland. I mean, he was absolutely outrageous. So you'd Sandy Clark and Robbo scoring goals for fun. Um, and again, you know, you, you looked at some of the hip sides that were, that were about then. Gordon Hunter was playing. Um, Alex Miller was the manager. Um, and Darren was involved there. Keith Wright was a great player. You had some really good derbies. Um, and the build-up to it in the week 
was just absolutely sensational, you know. And and I think, you know, even now, even in the old Easter Road, and in Tyne Castle, still cackling, the whole city was buzzing about it. So we're hoping for a good game from two rank rotten teams. Yeah, I think uh, both manage well. Both teams obviously go into the game under incredible pressure. Not so much Hearts, given the fact they've just brought in a new manager. They got the result on on Saturday, the four 0 win over St Mirren. But I think they've played a game more than Hibs. The two of them sitting at the bottom of the t- bottom of the table. I think Hibs are worse off by a goal. Is that right? Just uh, in terms of the goal difference, I think. Um, I wonder if it's just a game that Hibs fans are nervous about. They maybe like uh, maybe need it like a hole in the head at the minute, given the start that they've made to the campaign. I think there's no question that David Gray is under extraordinary pressure, which sounds ridiculous at this stage of the season, but I think that's just the reality of the position. I think um, I think a win for Hibs, as much as there is no evidence to suggest it will happen, I think it would give them an incredible lift. I think it might just kick them on. I just don't know that there's any compelling case that you could make for that to happen. I don't know that you've seen any evidence that they would be capable of getting a result against Hearts. Hearts, for their part, again, been such a limp start to the season. Obviously, maybe the very tentative signs of recovery, new manager coming in, getting an Im- immediate bounce at the weekend, whether or not that's sustainable now over the next couple of weeks as you look to piece together a sequence of results that would lift them up the table. But I I, I can't see anything other than a share of the points at the weekend. Yeah, um, well, it goes back to an old man, City manager, who uh, was asked what makes a great game, and he says two rank rotten defences. Uh, and, th- <laughs> and I think we might we might be in for that. The only problem I have with this, and you might be able to answer this from your own perspective, we digest it and discuss it every week. Do you find yourself as a journalist looking at pundits, listening to people now talking about managers being under pressure, and you cannot believe, as Alison said, it's it's five games, it's 10 games, it's 15 games, and people want them sacked. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's not, on a personal level, it's not something I particularly like. You know, you're sitting writing stuff and you, you, you can write people out of a job, let's be honest, at yeah. times, you know, if you're really harsh on it. So you have to be careful about how you word these things, and it's not nice to sit and see a manager go defeat after defeat after defeat, and you, you kind of know what's coming further down the line. But it is. You know, results-based business. These guys get contracts paid up, obviously, when, when if they are sacked and they leave their duty. So it's, it's kind of different from like you or I losing a job where you're, you know, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I need to go and sign on the dole, sort of thing. Um, but it's still a horrible, a horrible process when it happens. Um, How much of it is down to the Hibs board, though, in this case? Because you have a situation where a, a, a young man who has etched himself in the Hibs <coughs> history books um, is now again had a couple of stints at being the caretaker, now thrust in as the manager and all the pressures that that brings. And as I mentioned to Ali a couple of weeks ago, Sean Maloney said to me, Peter, I thought he was going to sack me after four weeks. He said what he'd, what, what he'd sold me and what I got was totally different. Mm. The, the goalposts were moved immediately and I, the alarm bells were ringing in my head from what I'd been sold to what I was actually watching unfold. And he said, and after four weeks, I actually came into the dressing room and I went home. And he says, and I was waiting for a call because I thought I was going to be sacked. 19 games later, he was. Yeah. I, I think some of the problems, you see Hibs changing managers and other clubs as well um, on a regular basis. So when you're doing that, when you're changing manager every year or every 10 months or every 14 months, that tells you the problems run a bit deeper than just who is running the team. And I think that's the case with David Gray here. I think David Gray is an extremely good coach. I don't think we should make any bones about that. But whether he was, he's clearly not getting results at the minute, as, you know, has he signed the right players? Has he been given the right players? Who who's making those decisions? What's the budget like? You know, all this sort of thing. That's there are all these things are a factor. Um, I would personally like to see David Gray probably work under a mentor at, at first at Hibs. You know, you can argue with yourself who you think that should be, or go away and take a smaller club, you know, an Aloha or something like that, or, and l- learn there, make his mistakes at that level, and then try and step up and become a manager in, in his own right further up the chain. Yeah, I think it's a difficult job, not just you know, any, taking any premiership club with the threat of, you know, relegation, you know, 
being down the bottom of the table, that's, that looms over so many clubs. That's a difficult position for any young manager to be in. Um, but he's taken, you know, if you're David Gray, you know, you're offered that job, you're going to take it as well. So you have to, you have to factor that in. Yeah, I, I listen, it's a decision lots of people make. Um, you know, Scott Brown, same situation. Yeah. Fleetwood didn't quite work out there, has gone to air. Charlie McGrew obviously wanted to be climbing the ladder within the Celtic structure, got the chance to be a coach, Hamilton Ackies. Um, and uh, as Barry has mentioned there, you have to you have to cut your teeth. Even the great Sir Alex started, I think, East Stirling. So, but it's so cutthroat now, it's so difficult. And as Barry said, that when the train stops at the station, it doesn't stop regularly at that station to give you that window of opportunity. And I think what probably worries young managers coming in that you can only really afford to have a couple of poor jobs and be out of a job before the offer stop coming uh, so I think there would be a wariness of what you'd accept and thinking well if, I, if, I, if I'm out of a job in a year or 18 months time and then the same thing happens again fairly quickly like all of a sudden you can find that your career is, is in the doldrums before you're really properly got up and running I think it is very difficult I think there is immense pressure on managers and coaches especially if you're going into a team and there is any pro prospect or fear of, of relegation because of the finances that are involved when you drop down the league now, if you think if you're talking about, talking about the top flight, dropping into the championship, the different differentials financially are huge, absolutely huge for clubs. So there's a, a big economic pressure there simply because it can't be allowed to happen for certain clubs. And for, for Hibs, I think it's way too early to be talking about anything like that. There's vast time yet to recover. But I don't think there is any doubt that you just don't have time. You, there, you have to see evidence that there is a team moving in the right direction. You have to see evidence that it's a squad capable of getting results and turning things around. That's a big problem. If you're not seeing it in your performances, what can you hang it on? Yeah, oh, well, you're the man who has to watch them week in, week out, Barry. Uh, the bookies have Hibs 11-8, to eight, the draw 5-2, to two, Hearts 2-1. to one. Um, It's at Easter Road. That may be a slight edge uh, on it. How do you see the game and who's best placed and how do you see it going? Last Before last weekend, you would probably have edged towards Hibs a little bit, I think. I think last weekend, the, the results for both teams and how those games went have maybe flipped it. I think it maybe edged it slightly towards Hearts now. Um, a draw wouldn't surprise me, as, as you say, Alison. I think a, you know, a draw is, is probably you know, something that everybody would look towards. But the, the Carts getting that win last week, 4-0, um, gives them a platform to go into this game, not just this game, but the rest of the season, obviously, under uh, Neil Critchley, and start building momentum. Momentum's everything is, in football, as we see with Aberdeen up the top of the league. Um, and Hibs losing from 2-1 from up, losing two goals, both in injury time to lose 3-2 at Dundee United, puts them on the back foot going into this game, which is clearly the last thing they want. So, um, yeah, I think... Hearts will certainly be going in there with confidence. Hearts have got a good record at Easter Road, as we all know, so that won't that won't uh, phase them at all. I think the the new manager situation might be a little bit of a factor because these derbies can take you back um, if you're not used to them. I think the atmosphere. I mean, the atmosphere will always be terrific. That's one thing that the Edinburgh derby's got. As we've seen in recent years, Celtic Rangers games and away fans being you know left out. I think you get a, you, you, the away fans make derbies for me. I think it's terrific having them there, and it's a great that Hearts and Hibs have got this reciprocal agreement where they give a, a full away, a full stand to away. Thanks, supporters. Barry. I thoroughly agree with you. What a sensible <laughs> guest we've got, by the way. Honestly, is where I, I just, every time the derby kicks off, I just post it. Proper derby, away supporters. It is. Um, it's great to see. It's great to hear. It's great to be involved and in sitting in amongst that atmosphere when it's. It's Bedlam, whether it's Easter Road or Tynecastle, and it's the one advantage that the Edinburgh Derby's got over the, the Celtic Rangers Derby is that they have that and they show no sign of losing. It's clearly important to both clubs and good on them for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm looking at them. I picked a combined Hibs Hearts 11. Look forward to it. Uh, because obviously everybody thinks, oh, how many people would, you know, the two of them are that bad. You're thinking, how many players from this side would get into that side? So I've picked this for you two to dismantle it, okay? Um, so I've got Gordon in goal. I've got Chris Cadden at right back. I've got Kent and Rolls and Penrith from Hearts in the three. 
Um, and I stand to be corrected in that. Um, the midfield four, I've got Danda, Meningame, Newell and Boyle. And then I've got Shankland and Vargas. Um, and by the way, I've picked those two and they've scored two goals since the start of the season. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. I mean, Boyle's got five goals in 11 games. Kukarevic has got two and nine. And they've got one win in the league each. It doesn't... Slim pickings. You know, I'm so... I'm just about to say yes, to you. Really you know, I, I'm looking, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder where, I wonder where Barry and Ali will dismantle my side here. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to pick in the back four. I'll put Chris Cadden here. He, doesn't, he plays slightly further forward at the moment as well. And probably, I haven't seen enough of Nicky on a regular basis to suggest that he's got any kind of form. Um, but Kent Rolls and Ben Rice, you know, just basically because, quite simply, I... I think Lewis Miller is a young boy who's got a mistake in him. Mm -hmm. um, I think he charges forward sometimes um, and there's a there's a wee bit of a learning curve to go there with him, like him as I do, but he still looks raw. And the rest of him's back four just fills me with dread at times. I think their back four has been particularly problematic. Yeah. This season. Well, not, not just this season, but it looks extraordinarily porous. And the goalkeeper too, I thought the goalkeeper was poor on Saturday. I take it Vicky Gordon in. Yeah. Yeah, I'd yeah. Have to yeah. Would you? I mean, is there anybody there that I'm missing, Barry? That you could think? The only one that jumps out at me, obviously, watching Hearts every week, and this is this is more a recent thing than since the start of the season, is Blair Spittle. They've obviously mm. been. I had Spittle in at left side, and I I replaced him with Boyle, on the basis so that Boyle's goals. Boyle's got goals. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, there's an argument for that. You could maybe stick Spittle in behind Shankland or Vargas. And yeah. Like, leave one of those out, but. Yeah, I, I, I don't have too much argument with that, Peter. Yeah, um, I, I'm going to go for it. Um, the prediction on this is so tough um, because they're so bad. Um, but I'm, go I'm going to edge towards Hearts winning 2-1. Okay, I wouldn't surprise... On the, again, after last week, it just wouldn't surprise you if Hearts went there and got you know a second one on the bounce. Um, but there's so much riding on it because the league situation, whoever loses... If there is a loser, they, they stay bottom of the league. That's... Does he lose his job? Well, I, I hope not. Um, I genuinely hope not, because it's just not a nice situation to be in. But we saw it with Stephen Naismith. The longer you're bottom of that table, the more the pressure increases, and eventually the axle swing. Yeah. He's got one win in nine. He's got two draws. There was already grumblings, even by the appointment, um, with Malky Mackay in the background, mm. you, you're looking, you're saying, right, OK, you're talking about a mentor. Is Malky Mackay the mentor? Is the Hibs board the structure wrong? Is the way they want to go about their business in the background with the Black Knights constantly coming out with quotes which destabilise the situation? And I'm looking at it and I'm saying to myself, well, wait a minute, one win in the league and you, if he were to lose, and I'm you, I'm in this camp. I, I think David Gray should be given the time, the backing, the season, um, <clears throat> and given transfer windows. That's my opinion. As you say, sometimes your opinion in your mind of what you want to happen and the reality of what unfolds is totally different. And I think if he lost to Derby in his own backyard. I just think it would be too the, the clamour for him to go would be too too much. I think it would be very difficult. I think uh, it also depends. I think maybe if he loses a game, how he loses it. Yeah. I think if you see a performance error, I still think there might be an argument that it wouldn't be sufficient to to save him. However, if you come out on the back of a three 0 or a four 0 you come back out on the other end of a comprehensive defeat. I think it's very difficult to argue the case. Even, I think, if it is tight and they still lose a game, I still think the weight of pressure on it may just force the issue. I think um, one win from the entirety of the campaign so far is shocking. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. That. Same goes for Hearts too. I think yeah. uh, I think it's not good enough for, for two clubs with the resources that they have, I think it's an appalling start. I think it, it it's reflective of how how poor they've been across the course of this opening quarter of the campaign. But I think much will depend on the manner of the performance in terms of whether or not it just becomes unsustainable. 
Yeah, the Hearts fans now can are just they've just drawn a line. This is a new dawn for it's them. Not, yeah. And they're looking and saying, right, well, let's see this Tony Bloom money. Let's see this money ball, Brighton superstructure, see how it all works and see if the fairy tale is delivered at Tyne Castle. So that's fine. Let's wait and see. We'll give Neil Critchley the benefit of the doubt. Um, but with Hibs, yes, a battering, you're gone. Yeah. You'll be gone. But the other aspect of it, which I constantly look at when you're looking at a team is, is there a structure? Is there a style? Is there a DNA where you can see what he's doing, but he's maybe just missing one or two players through injury or whatever? And that's where I'm, I'm looking at Hibs and I'm thinking, is there a style? you know, that you're starting to see on a regular basis that you think? Yeah, I, I think you definitely need to see progress. Yeah. Um, from more so kind of, if not week to week, then certainly month to month. If it's gradual progress, then you then you get a bit more time. After that, you're talking about injuries. I think Kieran Bowie, losing Kieran Bowie is a big one mm. Yeah. for Hibs. Um, I thought he was a terrific signing for them when he arrived. And, you know, he's obviously just getting started and then he's ruled out through, through injury, so... Losing a player of that calibre is definitely going to impact, but there's other players there, there's other very capable players there, other well-paid players there that, that do need to step up and do more in Abshut um, to get them out of this situation. Sunday's huge for them if they can go and put a performance in on Sunday and start looking like you know a, a team that's you know with a bit of structure, backbone, resilience, fight in them, then... I think the people above would look at that and say, "Yeah, you know, let's let's see how it goes over the next couple of games and uh, and judge it from there." But derbies can be derbies are unpredictable, as, as you know. So yeah, um, it'll be interesting because he's got a he's got a, a month where the board will also say, "Right, get the derby out the road. If you can get a win, great. Lifts everybody, buys you time. It also allows them to get into the month of uh, November with games that Hibs will look and say they're winnable." Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a Ross County, it's a Dundee United, it's a St Mirren, it's a Dundee, albeit at the end of it, they, you know, they've got Aberdeen and then Motherwell. But of all of those, I'm looking at them and saying, him should be going into those games, size of the club, the way they're going, you would think, can they build some kind of momentum out of this game? That's why I think it's huge. Absolutely, but the problem is that where Hibs are at the minute, you couldn't bank on them beating anyone like when you look at that and you think these are games that they should be winning it's one thing to say it it's another thing to go and actually do it and again you, you look at the evidence of this season I don't think any of them are a given I think um, I think they badly need something that they can hang their hat on something that says this is a team moving in the right direction this is a team capable of going and getting the results that they need and finding a bit of form, finding a bit of consistency, putting results together. I, I don't know where it's coming from. Two one hearts. I'm saying two each. I'll, I'll sit on the fence at the moment. Yeah. One one. One one. Okay. Uh, there you are. Um, by journals number 45, you know, you, you'll eventually get that kind of an edge <laughs> where you're fighting, <laughs> you're fighting non stop. By the way, just as a great little noise up um, for the benefit, always. Look and think to myself: Is there a, is there a kind of a great eleven that you could pick from? Because they've got such a brilliant back yeah, catalogue yeah. of players. So I picked the greatest ever Hibs team. Um, now some of them I haven't seen, but obviously through your time of researching and uh, you know taking advice and ha having spoken to so many people um, about players, um, surprisingly a lot of Hibs fans still favour Andy Gorham. Is one of the, yeah. the, the greatest uh, goalkeepers in their lineup. I don't think anybody would argue uh, he was absolutely top drawn, albeit a young developing goalkeeper that caught the eye of uh, Rangers. No problem for me picking the back four. John Brownlee, different class. Eric Shadler, uh, left back, superb. John Blackley and Jim Black. There's your classic. If Celtic were not as strong as they were in the early 70s, Hibs would have won three or four titles. They were that good. Um, and then the great Gordon Smith, um, who was a player, the last player, and I think the only ever player, he's won a title with Hearts, Hibs and Dundee. Mm -hmm. Top yeah. flight. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, and Ruffy tells me um, he was as cool as ice as well and used to be always looking manicured in the business. And that's not bad for Ruffy to <laughs> pay a compliment to him. Uh, Arthur Duncan, I've picked... 
Pat Stanton a given, Laurie Riley and Joe Baker. There might even be an argument for another member of the Famous Five, but I've thrown in there John McGinn well, um, yeah. on the basis that they win the Cup. I mean, it was a fabulous time for Hibs. They win that Cup in that day at Hamden. He was there, mm -hmm. and he was one of those players that everybody was looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so I threw him in there. It's not a bad 11. Is there anybody I've missed in your mind? Frank Sozzi's a definite... Frank Sozzi was the one I was definite Sozzi, contender. Yeah, I think yeah I definitely a Sozzi. contender, I have to say. You know? But who do you throw out? I know. That's what I was thinking. I'm saying to myself, the way I'm lining up here in a 4-4-2, you know, Frank Sozzi's a great player with Marseille. Yeah. You know, he's not uh, a great player with Hibs. He's a great player at the end of his career. Um, but he's not a great player who's contributed mm -hmm, to the rich mm -hmm. tapestry of their success. Every one of them, practically. Uh, in fact, I don't think I'm, every one of them is a winner. Yeah. You know? So are we going to Champions League goal scorer now too? Yeah, totally, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and now, uh, greatest ever Hearts team, Craig Gordon's still in there. <laughs> um, uh, I've picked a back four. Um, which, again, you'll probably be a little bit out of your depth here, guys. I've picked Alan McLaren. Mm -hmm. I thought he was a brilliant player. Um, I don't really have a strong enough right-back that was better than him. Um, Craig Levine, Dave Mackay and John Cumming. Um, and then Jimmy Wardhaw, Alfie Cohn, Willie Bald, Neil McCann, Stefan Adam and John Robertson. Now, that side looks... Very, very attack minded. So, so I think is, Craig, is indeed, I think Craig Levine would be shouting at me saying, "Wait a minute! I played a four six zero again for Scotland." Now. Who's those you, strikers? Is there a chance you could take some of those strikers off? Craig Levine's at the back. He was shouting, "Where's my midfield?" Exactly. Somebody to protect the back four. There's no midfield. I'm glad you said that, Barry. I was trying to think of it. And I'm saying, "My God Almighty! I've gone mental there." Um, but listen, it, it, it's a great derby. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. Really looking forward to it. As ever, you see so many old and friendly faces along the way. Um, now, the other thing I was going to say to you guys um, is quite simply, David Gray's not the only manager under pressure. It's a strange situation because, you know, right now, there's a, the storm gathering within the Premiership is, is the Rangers manager starting to really feel the heat. Yeah, October's always the month for it, isn't it? Every year you can bank on October, that's when the pressure starts to build on a couple of them. And, and right now it's Philip Clement, obviously, particularly after the weekend result with Kilmarnock. Um, I think he'll get a little bit more time. I don't think that I don't get the impression anyway that Rangers are at the point where they're going to be pulling any triggers too soon. But again, a couple of games and a couple of results can change that. So he's in a, a kind of precarious situation, probably exacerbated by Aberdeen being right up there, you know, on the same points total as Celtic. Celtic, obviously, I think everybody would accept the strongest team in the country at the moment, and Aberdeen are matching them stride for stride. So. It's not a good, if you're a Rangers manager, that's not a good situation to find yourself in. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it, it's, it's game by game, the grumblings of discontent are in the background. Some people have suggested, I think wrongly, Ali, I've noticed in a few you know, discussions about some people suggesting oh, it'll be a huge payoff for the Rangers manager. Uh, now, I don't think people know the background to it. More and more I'm speaking to agents who are saying to me, listen, you can sign an extension, you can get that four-year deal, but the payoff becomes six months. It's fine getting the four-year deal because it protects them if a club comes for their manager. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily here's four years' money nowadays because I think a lot of clubs are finding they just can't afford it. So they're saying, if, you, if you're getting sacked because you're not good enough, you've not done your job, here's, you're going to get six months to a year of your money. Yeah, I think there were lots of eyebrows raised when Philip Clement was offered that new contract at the beginning of the season for that very reason. I think there there was a sense of the club, one, properly backing him, showing a level of, of support, but two, thinking, well, if you get a couple of months into the season, does it become financially prohibitive to then part ways with the manager? So that's a very interesting point that you make, that that may not necessarily be the case. However, I think it's been... I think it's been an indifferent start to the season for Rangers. I think um, I was at the game on Sunday. I didn't think they looked like winning, bar a 10, 15 minute spell, maybe in the second period, where it looked as though they might just up the tempo. They hit the bar, and I think it was Dessers forced a, a decent save from McCrory. But there was just no real impetus in the game. I think there was no real energy or spark or fight. I thought it felt like a very apathetic 
performance, I think you would still struggle now to see a year down the line what the identity is of the team, what the philosophy is of the team, what it is that they are seeking to do, what, what characteristics are there in the way that they want to play. I think you would struggle to see it. I think they can ill afford to drop any more points. Now, we spoke about it uh, in the aftermath of lo losing <coughs> the Celtic, where you're saying, saying essentially it has to be perfect until you get to January. Well, it's, it's not been. And I think what happens when, when you're in that situation is that every game invites a microscopic intensity of what's this team doing, what direction is it going in. You cannot afford to drop anything at all, and that invites a level of pressure too. Yeah, I, I think if you were to, uh, you know, again, we look at identity, we look at style. If you were looking for the straw that breaks the camel's back, there's nothing worse for a Rangers fan than Pitaudry in a defeat. Indeed. Um, I think Alison's bang on there with the, the lack of creativity in the Rangers team is probably their biggest issue. and um, They don't look like scoring goals often enough. I think that's probably symptomatic of a bigger issue because Celtic financially are, are in a better position. They've got Champions League money coming in every year. Rangers haven't had that. So, you know, the, financially the, the gap gets a bit bigger and they can sign better players. Um, but Rangers, yeah, I mean, defeat at Pataudry doesn't bear thinking about, you know, for, for any Rangers team at any time, but particularly at this kind of time when there's a bit of pressure on and fans are a bit disgruntled, certain results haven't gone your way, you're just on the bit off the back of a defeat at Kilmarnock. It's, um, it's one of those situations, you, you think that, well, I said earlier that you'll get time, and I do think you'll get a bit of time, but caveat that with, you know, two defeats and forget the time, you know, people have had enough that they might get to that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you can... You can see European games for what they are. It's, a, it's an added bonus at times for Rangers because they do manage to perform well in Europe and, and produce results that sometimes nobody expects from them. Uh, and then, of course, you, you know you get a hammer at home against Leon. Does that add to the misery? You mentioned the word apathy. I think there's an apathy among Rangers fans at the moment. It's almost as if they've constantly put their hand in their pocket. They've constantly showed their support. They've constantly given the backing, uh, financially and verbally, to the side, and they're just watching it all the same movie year in year out. Uh, this one, I think, if you could, I think if you could see something on the part, and you can say, okay, I can see what he's trying to build here, mm -hmm. um, then you'd buy into it. I just think, I think Aberdeen might be the area where if it doesn't go according to plan, it'll be the straw that breaks the camel's back on this, but. Where they go from that, I do not know. Um, I know John Gilligan's, uh, having spoken to him, has got a difficult job now of trying to get a structure in place and then try to get... I think their biggest signing, Barry, is investment. Yeah, I mean, they, they, do need, they do need investment. They do need some kind of f some finances to come in and, and help them out a bit. Um, I do think Clement, he's been quite guarded in what he said publicly, rightly so, you know, you shouldn't be bad mouthing your, your own employer. Um, I think he's probably be frustrated behind the scenes and he'll keep that to himself. I do think the guy's a good coach um, and I think he can become a good Rangers manager but you're always judged against what, you, what Celtic are doing and how you're comparing to that and when Celtic are as strong as they are at the moment it's difficult for any Rangers manager. You could bracket them in similar circumstances to Hibs and say well they can change the manager over and over again but is it actually going to make any difference because um, there's other issues at play. Uh, I certainly think that's going on at the moment at Ibrox. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I could rhyme off from 1989 to 1997 so many Celtic managers who just get sacked. Yep. Um, some of them were good coaches. Um, uh, you don't beat Rangers, you don't win the title, you're out the door. Um, and some of them had potential and then pff, quickly gone, all that credibility in the bank was gone and they were sacked. And the reason for it was quite simply, Rangers could outspend them, they couldn't keep pace, and their biggest opposition in that nine in a row was Aberdeen. It wasn't Celtic. For about six or seven of the years, Celtic were just third, fourth, fifth. They were not a powerhouse. So it's an interesting uh, situation here. I think that very much, Barry, comes in to the mechanics, as you mentioned there. Um, interesting times, Scottish football just keeps on giving, I have to be honest with you, which is why I thought, just to finish off, I thought I'd just look at it, something just slightly uh, in a broader scale for you guys, because you are sports journalists after all. 
And when I woke up and I thought, oh, there's a school, oh, top 10. And I automatically thought about you, Ali. <laughs> top 10 greatest athletes of all time, according to US sports fans, mm -hmm. which was fantastic, Barry, because US sports fans think that the United States of America is the be-all and end-all and nothing else exists, you know, which is why the Green Bay Packers were world champions in the, the late 60s. And I'm thinking, world champions? Who else plays bloody American football? Um, so they had, US sports fans have voted the number one greatest athlete of all time, Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Then they've got Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. Then they've got Muhammad Ali, Babe Ruth, Kobe Bryant. LeBron James, Jim Thorpe, who was an all-round athlete um, from the early 20th century, uh, Lionel Messi, Pelly, and Serena Williams. One woman. So... Uh, Ryan Gold. Amazing. I can't believe he's not in it. Um, and, well, yeah. and by the way, you didn't see that coming there. But Ali just, just quickly just... <laughs> Drew my attention, one woman in there, um, <laughs> which is a great battle for us to have um, because greatest athletes of all time. Mm -hmm. So make your case. Give me a number one in your mind and then let's feed off it. I think I might have had Muhammad Ali at number one. Yeah, mm -hmm. give me number, give me, give me of the 10 without us getting into the, the, the lineup at the moment. Give me one, two, three, four, five or six women that you think, think should be in there. I've rattled over. Navratilova, nine times Wimbledon champion, okay. I think I would have Martina Navratilova. As one of the greatest of all time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah? Think... Even though Serena's won more than her? Yeah, I think it's an argument to have both of them in. Yeah, okay. I'm really comfortable with that. Who's, who else would you have in? Uh, no, I, 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 will, I, will give you the, I will give you the definitive ten that I've picked. Which you can dismantle. Well, let's see. But if you've, if How many you've, women have you got in yours? Uh, well, I'm, I'm about to tell you. I just need you to make a case for other women. I just need, I just need you a need other, to have a think. Have I a think about the way. women. But what I've picked out of all of them, um, and there was a case in my mind, do you pick them based on their sporting achievements? Do you pick it as the all-round individual? Um, it's a tough call. There's so many things that you could put in the equation. I've got I've got one woman in there, and and there's a debate on another woman that possibly, you know, for her all round contribution, it could be contended. I've picked Ali as number one um, because he was known everywhere in the world, and I think you know for his boxing ability, had he not taken that stance against um, Vietnam and the draft. You're talking about a three-year period where he would have been able to continue his boxing, his dominance, uh, his ability to dominate anyone coming forward. I thought he was a standalone for me, my all-time hero. Um, so, but he also suddenly elevated himself to a political, political figure, yeah. figure as well, didn't he, Barry? Yeah, he did. Um, I think that you think you're right. In what you say that did hinder him in his, terms of his career, but. Um, Improved his, his overall persona, if you like, you know, his, his reputation uh, and, and how far it was spread. So that was an issue. Um, I, I, I don't think any anybody could argue that he would be number one. I, I can't see a better sportsman personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got Pelly at number two. Pelly would be my number. Yeah, I, I had Pelly at number two because he's such a global phenomenon. Yeah. And the one thing I think, and I don't know how you feel, but I'll get your thoughts on this, but. The only thing that a number of people batter certain members of a generation with, with Lionel Messi, the only thing that I constantly have to remind people of is that South American football dominated world football in the early stages of the World uh, Cup as it stood. Whether Britain sent a team or not was neither here nor there. You're talking about 1958, and I think Wales were at the 1958 World Cup. Um... You're talking about a 17-year-old that the rest of the Brazilian team demanded to the manager, he has to be in the team. And at 17, scores two goals in a World Cup. Not, let's all wait and see if Messi's eventually going to win it. <laughs> this is 17, and he's the, one of the best players in the World Cup and scores two in a, you know, in a World Cup final, and they win 5-2. So I often have to try and highlight that to people because he's just so good 
And of all the people who saw it, look at the skills Messi does, look at these wee flicks, look at this. And if you go back and watch a video of Pelé, you know, whether he played exhibition games or not, he couldn't go and move to Europe because the Brazilian parliament and government would not let him leave the country. Mm -hmm. The other thing is he played at a time where players weren't protected in the same way that Messi has been protected and has been afforded a level, a level of... Um, ability to go and showcase his talents, whereas when Pele was playing, you could stop by any means fair or foul. Yes. You, know, you could tackle from behind. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could... Uh, well, when they you kicked him out of the 1966 I was just about to say, when you go back and look at the footage from some of the older World Cups, it was, you know, it was assault at points. Yeah, so I picked him. I picked Michael Jordan. because Jordan's got to be in. Jordan's just a phenomenon. I picked Tom Brady because you can't get to a point where you think, a lot of people were turning around going, I think it's Bill Belichick and Tom Brady goes, really? And then goes to the Buccaneers and wins <laughs> it with them. <laughs> so I wondered, I haven't seen the rest of your list, but I wondered if Tiger Woods had been there. Well, here's I a great, about here's a great argument for you. Because... That go. No, I'll let you finish. Sorry. I'll go, well, I'll go, I'll, I'll, Michael Phelps. Yes. Fine. Um, Serena Williams, for me, because... At the level the way women's tennis went, you know, Billie Jean King, for me, deserves a place in the history of tennis because she fought for the equality of women in the pay scale. And she was also a pioneer, um, you know, of women's, uh, not only equality, but rights, uh, you know, at certain tournaments as well, which I've, you know, I have nothing but admiration for her. But Serena Williams, because she was able to play at a level that was just outrageous um, for her 23 titles. I've got Usain Bolt in there because he's got to be the only 100 metres guy who ever had a wee look round and started smiling before he crossed the line. He started jogging before he finished. <laughs> That's another minor technicality, you're right, Barry. Uh, I've got Messi in there. I've just given a nod because I probably somebody will come up with a tenth one. I, I, I just mentioned Wayne Gretzky, who was the greatest ice hockey player of all time. Probably somebody can, I'm open to debate there. Now, my all-time favourite golfer is Jack Nicholas. He's won 18 majors. Mm -hmm. He won the Masters at 56. I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, I, I think, if anything, he's the GOAT. Tiger is a phenomenon, but, f you know, in the end, when you look, there was that period where he just fell off the edge of a cliff. Yeah, he did. Um, if you compare to Nicholas and Woods, then yes, you, you go Nicholas first. Um, I still think Woods, because of the outstanding talent that he had, would probably be in a top ten somewhere. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, not not near the top, I wouldn't have said, but probably bottom half. Um, yeah. I just think he's a... Is he, he the he GOAT for a, you in golf? Um, I was a kid when Nicholas was about, so... It, it, and I didn't watch a lot. I was too busy watching football at that point. Yeah. Um, he's certainly up there. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's, he's right up there. Just he, nobody had, when he came on the scene and, and was really at his peak. Nobody had seen anything like that kind of level of consistency. Yeah. From anybody in golf. He's yeah. almost like the the took footage. I remember because obviously working at STV, you're able to look at the footage as well. And I can remember old Scott Sports where they said there's a kid in you know in Buenos Aires, and they had black and white footage of Maradona you know, keeping equivalent of a tennis ball up there. Yeah. I mean, it was just outrageous. And people knew he was going to be a phenomenon. And then you see Tiger Woods as a kid, mm -hmm. and you think, Oof, this guy's going Would to come you? through and blow the place apart. Um, but you then, Maradona in your top ten? Uh, no, no. No, genuinely not, no. I, I, again, I'm probably I'm left myself wide open with Messi being in there. But Messi's domestic... Success and goals again, no, though. Like you think phenomenal. of the treatment that Maradona outrageous. had, you think of like how yeah. robust the physicality of yeah. the game was when Maradona was playing. Yeah, it's phenomenal the, the way and the, the height of him as well. I mean, height of nothing, and, and he just mm -hmm. he got kicked and got back up, and he got kicked and got back up, unless you happen to be the athletic Bilbao goalkeeper. <laughs> yes, um, but <laughs> that was one of the things I think that, that Maradona that, that endeared Maradona to, to fans was that that street. Mindset yeah, yeah, yeah. of if you yeah. kick me, I'm going to kick you harder when I get a chance. I quite liked that about him. Um, yeah. Would you have him in the top ten? Um, hmm. For nostalgia, probably yes. Yeah. But 
you can't have him above Pele. Um, yeah, I, can't, I, I would you know, have him in the top two. Pele, talking about you know the comparisons with Messi. Messi was in his well in his thirties by the time he won a World Cup. Pele had won three before he was thirty. Yeah, you know, it, just a ridiculous athlete. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my, I, I couldn't I couldn't form a top ten and not have Maradona in there. Yeah, well, listen, for the best basis of that, I'm I'm open to changing my mind. I will phone Wayne Gretzky personally <laughs> and just say these two have clobbered you. <laughs> You're not in. <laughs> um, I was trying to be broad minded about it. My God, they read Babe Ruth in there uh, as well, and the U.S. sports fans. Um, great memories, and of course, not always when these things come about. It's difficult if you haven't seen. Um, the majority of them, the ten that I put together, I, I'd watched them. You know, okay. I've been able to see Wayne Gretzky uh, playing in, in ice hockey, uh, so you got that coverage phenomenal. Uh, we've all seen Messi, Bolt, Serena Williams, phenomenal. Um, fortunately for me, Jack Nicholas was my dad's hero, mm. um, and you watched him and you just thought he's going to win today. There's just no doubt about it. Um, it's like. Do you know what's great about this, Barry? I always say to Ali, and I know you might not be a list person as well, but there's nothing better than sitting down with somebody. I, I wouldn't have a pint, but I'd have a Southern Comfort lemonade and I'd argue the case over the top ten. It's brilliant for pub chat, I'll give you that. Yeah, it's <laughs> terrific. And you can go on for hours and hours and hours. Just sitting there, as you say, over a couple of drinks and people giving different opinions. It's, it generates a great discussion. Here. Yeah, Spot absolutely. And if I can send a message to the editor of the Evening News, keep pressuring Barry into doing those <laughs> top ten lists. I love them. It's great. It's, it's well worth reading. Um, anyway, listen, Barry, it's been an absolute joy. Um, I shall undoubtedly see him at the Edinburgh Derby at Easter Road, Hibs against Hearts. Uh, and as ever, thanks to Ali. And if you like the journals, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. There's so much content there for you to consume. And if you download the app, you'll get all the breaking news at your fingertips, including all that unique video content that we're talking about. Hope you enjoyed the journals uh, from Alison Barry and myself, Peter Martin. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching.